My name's Courtney, and tonight we're going to be looking at the final components of Module 5, Business Combinations and Group Accounting. So you'll see here that Module 5 is worth a quarter of your exam, a lot of complicated areas. So we're going to spend this session working through questions and solutions, mostly on intra-group transactions, a little bit on NCI, and then investments in associates. So I've had this email come up about, I don't know, eight or 10 times as well as in the forums just recently. And the question people ask me is, what's going on? The First of all, from example 5.13, and then in the next question, what happens is there's a revaluation and then the accumulated depreciation gets eliminated. Why do we decrease accumulation by 40,000? And the key thing that people ask in question 5.13 is, hang on, the revaluation only moves by 20,000. Why do we reduce the accumulated depreciation to nil? And the answer is because if you've moved to fair value, there's no such thing as accumulated depreciation anymore. You're, you're scrubbing that old carrying amount minus accumulated depreciation equals written down value. And you are now showing the fair value. So it gets eliminated. So I hope that helps a few people with that question and understanding that concept. The next thing I want to point out is probably the, the trickiest area to get your head around, and it's important for tonight's session. How do we see this unrealized profit unwind over time? And so what happens is when we sell a depreciable asset into group and make a profit on that, it's an unrealized profit. And then we say that the profit is realized through depreciation. It's kind of weird, but the examples tonight will make sense. But like I say, read this 10 times if you have to for it to make sense. But it's a bit like when our, we have temporary differences in Module 4, tax base and accounting purposes and different depreciation rates. At the end of the time period, they reconcile back to themselves. And that's what's happening here. If you revalue an asset to 130 because you've sold it into group, it's $30,000 more. But every year, the depreciation is going to be that $6,000 difference over that five-year period. And so over the five years, it will depreciate down to nothing. And uh, so read that. Don't be intimidated by it, but you might have to read it, as I said, 10 times. So last week, we looked at business combinations, acquisition, and specifically the consolidated worksheet with Pluto Limited. And then, uh, so tonight we'll finish off on that consolidation preparation. I just want to show you quickly from last week Pluto, because hopefully when you see something a week later and a week later, ah, oh, it's starting to make more sense now. So here we had Pluto buying Saturn. The Saturn's current assets were revalued to 36000 up from twenty six, and the non-current to 95000 up to 115000 So plus 10, plus 20. So if we're going to work out the first component when we want to get to goodwill. What is the fair value of net identifiable assets? Take our current assets, revalue them 10,000. Don't forget the relevant DTL as well. Non-current assets were 95, increase 20. Don't forget the DTL. Take away our liabilities, easy to forget that bit there. And we have our fair value of net identifiable assets. So our goodwill, we get our consideration, we subtract the goodwill, and it's going to look like this. So here's our goodwill calculation. Remember, consideration transferred, add fair value of previously held interest, not existent here, add non-controlling interest, not existent here, goodwill calculation. So uh, the detailed webinar goes through that step by step in the last session, but hopefully looking at it again, you say, oh, yeah, that's right, it's getting easier. Revalue up. DTL, read value up, DTL, adjust. There's my fair value of net identifiable assets. So then the consolidated worksheet. This is what it's going to look like. We've got to get rid of the subsidiaries issued share capital. Now, when it's 100% ownership, nice and easy. Uh, we'll probably look at a different situation where it's uh, there's an NCI percentage, right? We just want to get it back to 85 because the 10 of Saturn is inside the 85 of Pluto. It's not in addition to, so it's eliminated. Same thing happens with retained earnings. They get eliminated. Our liabilities uh, just get added together. We had to revalue our current assets and we revalued our non-current assets and that triggered a revaluation surplus and DTLs. 
and then there was a business combination reserve. There's that goodwill number. Here's the journal entry that maps to the goodwill and we do our elimination. So we eliminated the retained earnings, the issued share capital and the business combination reserve and revaluation. We left the DTLs and our amount here, 4,000 goodwill is the reconciling number that gives us the full worksheet. So it's quite, if you ask yourself three things, can I eliminate my share capital and retained earnings? Can I adjust for any revaluations of uh, assets? So step one, step two, can I calculate my goodwill? If you can do those three things, you should be able to do a consolidated worksheet. Uh, yeah, I hope you get 100% in the exam. Don't worry, when you get to do one of our practice exams, I bet you somehow maybe that it's going to be a bit tougher than this one because we want to stretch you to that next level. So if we test you and it's not 100% and then you get 100% one in the exam, you're going to be like, so easy. So jump in and do that practice exam. Uh, Rashida, I'll have a look at your question in a minute. Um, oh, struggling to find out what components should be considered. I would say use this flowchart. So start at the beginning and, and work through each item and say, have I done each of these steps? And that should make you remember each of the items. So tonight, eliminate intra-group transactions. Last week, we showed what's going to take place. Here's the logic. Parent buys inventory for 15000 then it sells it within the group for 20. This 5,000 profit does not exist. So here, the parent selling it for 20 to the subsidiary, this profit is unrealized. So what we've got to do is eliminate that. Then if the subsidiary later on sells the inventory and makes 7,000 profit, we need to figure out what the true value is, what's actually been realized. So the key numbers here, are going to be our original um, sale and cost of goods sold. So we need to get back to the 22, the real number. We need the real 15, and then that will give us the proper profit figure. That's the logic of what we're working on when we do our intra-group transactions. And then there's other ones that are nowhere near as complicated because there's no effect on profit in the same way because we've not got either depreciation to deal with or cost of goods sold. They are the two things that make life very difficult. So management services, intragroup dividends, intragroup interest, the logic is here. The revenue on one side is identical to the expenses on the other. That's why it's much easier. It's not like revenue, cost of goods sold. So the total net effect is going to be zero. Now, in the accounts, things are going to be a bit weird because the total profit is, is 180 equals total 180,000. The total amount's going to be the same. It's just in the wrong parent or subsidiary. Much easier to eliminate and adjust than depreciation uh, assets or inventory. What's the other word to say realised or unrealised? Unrealised means you haven't sold it outside of the group. Realised means it's gone outside of the group. It's been consumed, realised, used up. All right, so case study 5.2. So this is the, the data from earlier. Um, and we looked at this briefly last week. But once again, I just want to show it to you. Entity sold inventory to a subsidiary for $40,000. So there's been a sale, but it doesn't exist. So I just want to show you how these journals eliminate it. That uh, debit to sales brings it down to zero. And there is no cost of goods sold. Normally it has a debit, so we credit the cost of goods sold. We have turned this sale into nothing. That's how we've done that elimination. But one thing happens. We've made a profit of $10,000, and that's going to create a $3,000 tax expense. Now, because of that tax expense, it's still going to be paid, but it's paid early from the group perspective. From the parent's perspective, it's a genuine payment. But from the group perspective, it got paid early and we won't pay that tax later on when the group makes the sale of that inventory and makes that genuine profit. So because we won't pay it later on, we have a deferred tax asset. So that's that corresponding here. Finally, we have inventory of 40,000, but this is overvalued. So the parent 
has sold the inventory to the subsidiary. See how it's now in the books of the subsidiary? But that is 40,000 and it's too high. So we bring it down with a $10,000 credit. That will reduce our inventory to 30,000. Bring it back to where it should be. So there is now no sale and the inventory balance is gonna be 30,000. So the only thing different now is it going to be this deferred tax asset. Uh, that's, they're not an identical uh, set of data, Manu. So here are the tasks. And my first question is, did you attempt all the tasks? There were about 12 questions, but within the 12 questions all up, there's probably about 40 activities to perform. Arashidi, uh, if you could email me that kind of question, just because I um, I can't do that off the top of my head. I'll I'll focus on my answers and then I'll uh, go from there. All right, so five types of transactions. And as I said before, I'll, I won't talk about it again, but the elimination of the 40,000 accumulated depreciation, that's a fair value concept. So, oh, Rashid, I'll be able to show, answer that when we get to question one. All right, sale of depreciable asset. On the 1st of January, Bully sold a delivery machine to Timid. Parent to subsidiary, 60,000. The machine had a carrying amount of 50. Bully depreciates at 20%. Timid depreciates at 10%. So you've already got a problem similar to what you've mentioned, Rashid, in your question. So what rate will the machine be depreciated at? And the answer is 10%. Why? Because that's in the hands of the user. That is the new usage of that asset. So for page 416 outlines, there's no clear heading in the study guide that tells you, but the point here is, even though you've got to bring it back to the original values of where it was, so the machine had a carrying amount of 50,000. So this 60,000 is going to be overstated. We have to bring it back to 50,000, but we don't continue to use the 20% rate. It's no longer relevant because in the hands of Timid, it's going to be lasting 10 years. So then from the group perspective, it's still going to last 10 years. And go back to module one, what's the right thing to do? Use the rate that best reflects the usage of that asset. So... It is saying here, it's irrelevant that the parent used a different rate because the subsidiary now controls the asset. And sadly, this is where it's a bit annoying. This I think comes from the solution in page 496. So instead of actually putting it in a nice bold heading in the study guide, it happens here. But the group should depreciate uh, a depreciable non-current asset using the same method and rate applied by the member of the group using the item because they're the one that controls it. Ah, this, this helps steal it. So it's got that reducing ballot, but now it's been sold to the parents, being used more evenly. Just use, because if you don't get this percentage right, none of your calculations will work after that. So question 1B, what is the unrealized profit? It was carrying them out 50, you sold it for 60, not a tricky question sold it for 60, carry amount 50, unrealized profit is 10. This is the amount that has not been sold outside of the group. So now we're going on, uh, what is the unrealized profit or loss ignoring the tax effects? So we have $10,000 of unrealized profit, but watch what happens here. We now have a $1,000 depreciation to adjust for because 10% depreciation of 60 grand, 6,000. 10% depreciation at 50,000, 5,000. We have a $1,000 depreciation difference. So our unrealized profit at the end of the year, because this happened on the 1st of January. So we're now up to the end of the year. The unrealized profit is only 9,000. Now you remember that confusing paragraph that says unrealized profits get used up through depreciation. We're starting to see that here. You see, it's not a 10,000 profit anymore because there was more depreciation on the 60. That's wound it back $1,000 in the first year. So the depreciation for the group is $1,000 less than for individuals. So 10,000 on the total sale of the asset, 
down 1,000 because there's six of depreciation for one and five of depreciation for the other. This part will actually help make this bit clear. So what will be the carrying amount of the machine in the books of Timid? Now, Timid has bought it for 60,000. So it costs 60,000. 10% depreciation, because we have to use that 10%, is 6,000. So the carrying amount is 54,000. What will be the carrying amount for the group? The carrying amount for the group is the original 50,000 and the real depreciation is 50,000, but using the new rate, 10%. The carrying amount is 45,000. So have a look what's happening here. We can easily see the difference. The unrealized profit has gone from 10,000 to 9,000. So this helps explain that an unrealized profit is being chopped off as the depreciation realizes the use of the asset. Yeah, it only makes sense once you've worked through a few questions and seen these numbers. Um, Wayne, you've asked, don't get the 60,000 and 4,000 depreciation that's sold on the 1st of January. Um, you're, okay, cool, making sense now? So now you can see how I'm just bringing in extra levels of complication. What's going to happen with tax included? Well, we have a 10,000 profit on the sale. We've got to get rid of that but that's gonna drop by 1,000 because of the difference in the depreciation. So the profit on sale, but the $1,000 in depreciation. So we have a 9,000 amount, but the key here is tax of 2,700. So the net effect on profit is 6,300. So that's how we bring in the net effect. Now, as I show you, I'm gonna show you some worksheets as well. So if this didn't click for you, don't worry, we're gonna go through some more questions. Now we're up to lion and zebra. Situation number two, it's a pretty similar situation. Why would I do the same question? Because practice makes it click. So what are the consolidation elimination journals? This time I'm asking for the journal at the end of the year. So 1st of January, now the end of the year. What do we have? We have a $10,000 unrealized profit. Lion depreciates at 20%, but guess what? Lion has sold it, so that's irrelevant. The number that's relevant is 10%. It gets easier as you work through. So have a look at this consolidated worksheet and what we need to eliminate. In the books of the subsidiary, we have an asset of 40,000. We bought the delivery truck for $40,000. We are going to do depreciation at 10%. So our depreciation is here, 10%. But in the true books of the overall entity, the carrying amount is really 30,000. So what should the real depreciation be? $3,000. So how do we get from 4,000 to 3,000? Simple, debit 4,000 expense. So we want to credit the same expense by 1,000. If we credit our depreciation, we will bring it to the correct amount, 3,000, which is 10% of this. So that's that first step. The next thing we want to adjust for is uh, you'll see we've made a profit on sale, but we didn't really make a profit on sale. So we have to eliminate that profit on sale. The next thing we've got to deal with is our income tax expense over here. So income tax expense, if we made 10,000 profit, then we are going to have to pay 3,000 income tax. But, and this is where it gets a bit tricky, our subsidiary has more depreciation, 4,000 instead of 3,000. So that is going to reduce our profit for the subsidiary by 1,000. Reduce our profit means we will pay less tax. Remember from module four, if you can push your taxable income down, you'll pay less tax. So, and I'll clear the screen, make it a bit easier. See this 300 here? We have to pay 3,000 in tax for the parent because we made a $10,000 profit, even though it's unrealized. But on the other side, our depreciation has gone up by $1,000 more. And if our depreciation goes up in the books of the subsidiary, that is genuine depreciation. That will push down the taxable profit. So it will pay 300 less tax. So parent pays 3,000 more, 
subsidiary pays 300 less. So plus 3,000 minus 300 for the subsidiary, the net amount is 2,700. So 10,000 profit in the hands of the parent, but 1,000 less in the hands of the subsidiary. Remember, we're realizing that profit through depreciation. So the net difference in the profit is $9,000. The unrealized profit now is 9,000. So I hope that helped. The other things we've got to fix, the delivery truck was 40,000, but it needs to be dropped to 30,000 because the proper amount is 30,000. So just a credit to that amount, that will reduce the asset. The accumulated depreciation is overstated because it was 4,000. Just like we fixed the depreciation here, we have to fix the accumulated depreciation here. And that 2,700 income tax expense ties up with our deferred tax asset. Okay, so what does this look like in terms of a consolidated journal entry? I've showed it to you in the worksheet. 10,000 profit on sale of the truck. We've got rid of that with a debit. Credit to the vehicle. We've reduced the value of the vehicle. So as you can see here, this credit reduced the value of the vehicle from 40,000 to 30,000. Debit accumulated depreciation. We brought it down 1,000 because it was too high. It was four. Debit at 1,000 brings it down to three. Then we've got credit to depreciation. Once again, it was 1,000 too high. Bring it down 1,000. Our deferred tax asset is linked to that 2,700. So that 2,700 is because we paid too much tax on the 3,000. We paid 3,000 too much tax for the parent because it's an unrealized gain, but we saved 300 tax because we had higher depreciation because our depreciation was based on that. So before I move on from here, does this 2,700 number make sense to you? Cool. So each of these explain how those were calculated as well, but I've talked through that. All right. Sandeep, not the 300. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll try and explain that again in a different question. So now, what is the consolidated elimination journal on the 20X5? This is where people get a bit messed up. 20X5 is the end of the second year. Now, what we need to do when we do a consolidated worksheet, we don't keep it and add to last year's. We have to rebuild it from scratch. Exactly, something to do with retained earnings. So in the previous year, we had a 10,000 profit. We had 1,000 of extra depreciation and we had an income tax expense of 2,700, but none of that is going to be in the books this year, because we're looking at this year's books and we've closed off the income statement. But what number will have carried forward? See this 6,300? That is the combination of the 10,000 minus 1,000. So that's the 9,000 extra profit less the income tax expense. That has what's gone through to our retained earnings. So our retained earnings number has to be Included, we are going to eliminate the retained earnings because that 6300 is the memory of these three items. So we need to get rid of the 6300. What else do we need to adjust? Every year we will need to do this because our depreciation is 1000 too high. So 4000 down 1000 to 3000. Uh, we now have to bring our delivery truck because it's overvalued. It's recorded at 40 and it needs to be 30. So bring it down to 30 by dropping it by 10. Our accumulated depreciation was 4,000 last year plus 4,000 this year is now 8,000. We need to bring it down by two. This is where people get stuck again. Why do we bring it down by two? Because the consolidated worksheet is done brand new every year. So it has to remember last year plus this year because 
the income statement isn't remembered. Remember, we have to go and get this 6300 from retained earnings because we have to bring it forward from last year because it's a brand new consolidated worksheet. Exactly the same thing happens. So if we go back in time, I have to go back quite a few to the previous year, this is the 4000 So when it was 4000 we had to eliminate 1000 but it's not 4000 We have to do the 4000 from last year and we have to do the 4000 from this year. So we're doing two years worth of adjustment to accumulated depreciation. But the 8,000s, and, and this is probably the biggest mistake people make, they do 1,000 for depreciation and their brain goes, why would I, why would I do 2,000 for accumulated depreciation? And the answer is you are doing two years worth because it's now the second year in exactly the same way as you have to adjust for retained earnings. Did that give you a quick moment, anyone? why the accumulated depreciation ends up getting higher rather than uh, lower. Great. So, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> yeah, every year you've got to adjust for that retained earnings be because the consolidated worksheet is new every single year. So what's the journal? The journal is just debit retained earnings. So if we go back to the previous edition of the journal, we did it like this. We did 1,000 to depreciation. Uh, we did 2,700 to tax expense and we had our um, profit on sale. Now, these numbers from the previous year are now in retained earnings. So it's doing the same transaction but in one quick journal. So that debit 6,300 gets rid of the original sale and depreciation and income tax expense. Uh, so, Gio, <laughs> uh, did we record the first year's elimination? Yes, you did that in year one. Now, when it comes to the end of the next year, you start your consolidation worksheet again from zero, from scratch. You do the consolidate. You don't keep a set of consolidated books. You only consolidate at the end of the year. It's not double counting because you, you don't keep last year's books. You're not adding on last year's. You're throwing last year's away. So now you have to do it again. So because this is a balance sheet item, 10,000. So here's note one. That's our 6,300, which I explained. These are the three items from last year that have to be eliminated again. But when we go through our accounts, we don't open up last year's books. They are sitting in retained profits. So number two, we've got to get rid of the truck uh, because it's 10,000 too high. So to bring it from 40 to 30, we credit it. Next. Item number three, the accumulated depreciation. It's always, uh, it's going to increase year on year because it's got last year and this year. See what it says? Remember, accumulated depreciation has to carry forward from 20X4 and the depreciation from 20X5. Then note, note four is our depreciation for the year. Oh, we've done that. Now our tax expense, 300. Remember, every year the subsidiary um, is going to get this $300 benefit because it's going to reduce its tax bill because its depreciation is $1,000 higher. $1,000 higher depreciation pushes down your taxable profit. So you pay $300 less tax now. So debit to your tax expense. And then finally, debit to the deferred tax asset that corresponding amount. Now, remember last year it was worth 2,700, but with that debit to tax expense, now it's only worth 2,400. Uh, so yeah, you will need to, I'll just check the chat box. It's, uh, would it always be in return? Da, da, da. Why is this so bad? Uh, do you have to zero out retained earnings every year? Yeah, you're going to have to remember to do this every single year until until it's done, until five, uh, it's going to be depreciating for 10 years. So for 10 years, you're going to have this excessive amount until that truck is sold or written off. All right, number three, sale of depreciable assets, illumination journal. So this time, subsidiary sold plant with a carrying amount of 350 for 600,000. On the date of sale, the plant had a remaining useful life of seven years. However, City intends to use it for 10 years. 
So now that you're getting used to that, you know to always look at who is the user. They We're going to use it at 10% because that's the new way. So what are the consolidation elimination journal entries? So first of all, depreciation used to be across seven years on 350,000. So it was 50,000 uh, per year. Is that right? Yeah. And now it's at 60,000 per year. So our depreciation expense of 60,000 at 10% is too high and needs to be reduced. One of the things that's going to happen is uh, we've got to eliminate our profit on sale and we have our adjustments here. So our profit before tax is going to be lower because we have this depreciation, this extra depreciation, and we have to get our planned asset down. So we have to credit that to 50. We have to adjust our accumulated depreciation to bring it back to where it should be. And our deferred tax asset is going to be that linked to our ITE67500. So our, if we worked out 10 years worth of depreciation on the city, 35,000 a year, you can see that we're gonna credit that 25,000, that's brought it down to the correct amount of depreciation. So the journals will look like this. Get rid of the profit by debiting 250. Reduce the value of the plant by 250. So that's, uh, I'll show you. That got rid of the profit, 250, and it got rid of the plant asset being overvalued. So now we have zero profit and the plant asset is back to its original. So we've solved situation one. Now we have accumulated depreciation that we have to eliminate because it's too high. It should be 35,000, but it's actually 60. So 60 take away 25, 60 take away 25, and that fixes our depreciation. So it's now 10% of the 350,000. So next, before I've gone too far, deferred tax asset, 67,500, tax expense, 67,500. And what we've got is this number here. So where do we get the 67,500? Well, we had our profit of 250, but we don't have tax on that total amount because we have extra depreciation. So in the hands of the subsidiary, we've made more profit. We will pay more tax. We are going to have to pay 75,000 more. But in the hands of the parent, we've got higher depreciation, which will push our taxable profit down by 25,000, saving us 7,500 tax. So tax goes up 75, but down 7,500 net income outcome, 67,500. So now that's at the end of 30th of June, 20X7. Of course, let's take it to the next year. This is hopefully now you go, oh yeah, the things I've got to look for, what's going to happen with my accumulated depreciation, for example, uh, that has to double up, that has to grow. Now we have our retained earnings component needs to be adjusted. Remember, we have our profit before tax from last year up to 50, less the extra depreciation of 25. So this 67,500, 25 and 250 is going to come through to our retained earnings. Have a look at our accumulated depreciation. It's 120,000 because it's last year plus this year. So we have to adjust two years worth of accumulated depreciation. See how the excess depreciation is only 25,000, but what we've got is two years worth of accumulated depreciation. That's why two years worth. Uh, we're not deducting 35,000, we're deducting 25,000 to bring us to the correct amount of 35,000 because 35,000 is 10% of the proper carrying amount. It now has a useful life of 10 years. So retained earnings, 157,500 because that is the combination of the extra profit from last year less the extra depreciation 
less the income tax expense. So these were the three items from last year netted together in our retained earnings. We reduce our plant, our balance sheet item by the same because it grew too much. And this is the one that people go, oh, that doesn't look like it balances. But it does make sense because we are creating the consolidated worksheet from scratch. So we've got to account for last year's accumulated depreciation plus this year's. So that's why it's 50,000. Going back to here, take a look at this. Our accumulated depreciation is two years of $60,000. And so it's 50,000 too high. It should only be 70. 70 is the right amount. 120 minus 50 should be 70 because we should have two years of $35,000. And then our tax expense here, 7,500. Why? Because in this year, we are going to reduce our tax bill by seven and a half thousand dollars because our depreciation our extra depreciation is 25 grand pushes down our taxable profit therefore we will pay less tax 30 percent of that 25 thousand seven thousand five hundred so our dta now in module four you recoup your dta's you use them up but when we do a consolidated worksheet that's not what's happening in year one you work out your dta so we'll go back for a second have a look here, our DTA was 67,500. But now we're in the next year, our DTA is only 60,000 because we're another year further on. The asset value is getting closer together. Now we haven't recouped anything because we don't record a DTA and carry it forward into the next year. The consolidated worksheet is created each year separately. So this is just reflecting a at the end of the second year, this is what the DTA will be. Moving on, question number four. Assuming all the inventory was on hand, what are the consolidation elimination journals? So the parent sold inventory for 8,000. That part's easy to eliminate, but the problem is we've now got this cost factor in place. So the parent sold goods for 8,000 that cost six and made 2,000 profit. Simple to eliminate. Get rid of the sales with a debit. Get rid of the cost of goods sold with a credit. And you can see they are now zero. I like to put them in a table like this because if I just do the journal entries, it's hard to visualize, but I like looking at it here. So my gross profit is $2,000. So I'm going to have to pay tax on that because in the books of P, I made the profit, I now pay the tax. But from the group perspective, that's paying the tax too early. That therefore will create a deferred tax asset of 600. Now, one other number I need to adjust for. My inventory is now in the books of S at 8,000, but that is not correct. I have to report my inventory in the consolidated books at what it really cost me. So how do I get from 8,000 to 6,000, I need to credit my inventory by $2,000. So at the end of my consolidation, the sale has disappeared and I've reduced my inventory back to the correct amount, 6,000. So the only thing I now have is 6,000 there and a deferred tax asset of 600. That's correct. There's an unrealized profit of $2,000 that needs to be acknowledged and that will generate this $600 DTA. So hopefully that's a, a reasonably easy one. Uh, yes, if, if it gets sold externally, um, it's totally different. That would be realized profit, but we're only dealing with intra-group transactions when P sells to S or S sells to P. So you eliminate unrealized profit anytime you sell within the group. Before I move on, do people look at that and say, I get it, this makes sense. I hope this is a, a fairly simple one. Great. Yeah, this one was a bit easier. So what will a journal entry look like? So when you see a journal like this, you say, where did it all come from? It's as simple as saying here, debit, credit, 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 debit. So we've got a debit, oh, I went too far, debit of 8,000 
debit deferred tax asset. So I've eliminated my sale. I've eliminated my cost of goods sold. I have now reduced the value of my inventory because it was 8,000 and it needs to come back to six. I have a deferred tax asset because I made $2,000 unrealized profit. I paid tax on that. So I've got to pay my 600 tax. I have a deferred tax asset. So that's why I like to use this structure to visualize my transaction. And then that gives me the journal without much thinking at all. So that's the journal entry as so. Moving on from 4A. Uh, can I explain the DTA again? Uh, deferred tax asset. If you pay more tax now uh, from a group perspective, then you should, then you'll pay less tax later. When you sell the inventory outside the group, you won't pay tax again. Therefore, you have a deferred tax asset. So this is where it gets hard. Assuming half the inventory was on hand, that means you sold the other half outside the group. So first step, eliminate and eliminate that initial transaction. So that's eliminated. But now we don't have to eliminate the inventory all the way down. Originally, the inventory went from 6000 up to 8000 So it was $2,000 overstated. But we've sold half of it. So now it can only be 1,000 overstated because now we had 3,000 of inventory written as four in the books equals 1,000 overstated because half of it has been sold outside. Great, it's been realized. So we still have to fix the 1,000 overstated in the accounts. Then there's cost of goods sold, which is also overstated. So we need to eliminate the 1,000 in cost of goods sold because it was too high. Once again, deferred tax asset and tax expense. All right. Assuming half the inventory was on hand at the end of 31 December 20XA, uh, oh, this is just showing a combination of the journal. So there's 861133. You can see our cost of goods sold appears twice. So you can combine the cost of goods sold together. I actually like to do it line by line by line. It just stops me forgetting anything. But if you're quick and fast, uh, you can combine the two. Now we go another year on. So it was October 20X8. We're now in 20X9. And what if the remaining inventory was sold in this year? So once again, it brings in that retained earnings situation because we do the consolidated worksheet every year. So we carry forward the effects of 20X4. It says 20X4, it should say 20X8. We made an $8,000 sale, eliminate, minus the 7,000, minus the 3,000. So that was the same, if we go to 4B, 8,000, 7,000, and our 300. They were in the accounts, but they are now going to be in the retained profits in the following year. Credit cost of goods sold and debit to our tax expense. Assuming all the inventory was on hand, are we in the same one? Son and father, different scenario. 1st of August, son sold inventory, cost 15000 to the parent. So immediately $5,000 unrealized profit needs to be eliminated. So we eliminate the sale. We eliminate the cost of goods sold. Sales are down, cost of goods sold. The 5,000 profit is dealt with. Now, the inventory needs to be adjusted for here as well. Our inventory asset went from 15,000 to 20. We have to bring it back down to its proper amount. So credit it 5,000. But we made a $5,000 sale. And therefore, from the tax department's perspective, we have to pay 30% tax on that. So that's going to be a, an expense of $1,500. And because we're paying that tax too early, from the group perspective, we have a deferred tax asset because later on, we will not pay that tax again. So when it's sold outside the group, we won't pay the tax. And if we don't have to pay tax, that's a future benefit deferred tax asset. So to see, it gets, I think once you've done a few, that logic, you, you just get faster and faster and faster. 5B, 
assuming 25% of inventory on hand. So 75% has now been sold. So the first two steps don't change. Eliminate the original sale and cost of goods sold. Now we adjust the inventory. Now 75% has been sold. So 25% on hand. Our inventory was 5,000 too high from 15 to 20 overvalued. But instead of crediting at 5,000, we don't have to do that anymore. We only have to do it for the 25% that is still on hand. So 25% of the inventory is still on hand. That's $4,000. And that's way too high. Uh, it needs to be reduced by 1,250 because that would be the correct amount. Cost of goods sold, adjusting for that. The cost of goods sold was too high because it was based on the $20,000 inventory cost, not 15. So 75% of that $5,000 overstatement. So this $5,000 too high value means when you sell it, cost of goods sold will be too high. So we've got to reduce that. Once again, we have a tax expense. And therefore, because we've made this sale, not 100% hasn't been sold outside yet. So there was a total profit of five grand. Now of that, 75% has been realized. So 25% has not. So we work out that 25% and that's the unrealized profit times the tax rate gives us our deferred tax asset. 25% tax has been paid and has yet to be earned properly. When that 25% is earned, we won't have to pay tax on it. All right. Hopefully you're still awake. We're ha nearly halfway through the questions and it's already 20 past nine. 5B. Uh, I'll come back to why do we need to take the entry to cost of goods sold? Number one, we have to eliminate the original cost of goods sold. Secondly, we have now sold the original amount. Some of that original 15,000 cost here has been sold now. It's been sold outside the group. 75% of that's been sold out of the group. So we do need to adjust for that amount. Uh, Rashida, I, my gut feeling is we're not going to get to NCI today. I'm going to have to do an additional recording for that. Um, I might allocate extra time next week to go through an NCI. There's just a lot of ground to cover. Uh, why not COGS calculated with the 25%? It is calculated with the 25%. Uh, it's the reciprocal of that 75% there. Because you, you're, it, I'll try and um, explain it once. Uh, let me go through a few more. Once again, you can combine the journal entry, cost of goods sold. Uh, in, in a few minutes, I'm going to go through a, another one that shows you that layer by layer, and I think that'll help you click for you. 5C, moving on a year. What if the remaining inventory was sold in the 20X8? Once again, we have our retained earnings structure here. So what we've got to remember is whenever we work out the first year, there's the sale, 20,000, let's say 10,750 minus the 375, then our cost of goods sold, the 5,000 at 25%, that's the final 25%. So what's happened here? We had our cost of goods sold overstated by $5,000 because in the books of the parent, it was sitting at 20,000. So as that got sold, cost of goods sold was 20,000, but it needed to only be 15,000. How do we bring it down? We have the 5,000 overstatement of cost of goods sold and a quarter of it was sold in this period. So this eliminates the $5,000 overstatement, the quarter of that amount that relates to this period. In the previous example, it was 75% because three quarters of the 5,000 was overstated and needed to be brought down. So I hope that helps um, Kim with that item. This is showing you this year, 25% of the goods are sold. So we deal with 25% of that 5,000 overstatement. Intra-group dividend elimination. Now I hope you'll get, you get these in your exam because this is much easier. Debit, dividend income, credit, dividend retained earnings. So 20th of December, 20X1, declared and paid the dividend. This is the little twist in the tail. 
90% were made to high limited. So we don't need to adjust for this 10%, only the 90% that was an internal transfer. So debit to dividend income, because it hasn't actually been earned, credit dividend, retained earnings. So we're undoing it, but only 90%. So that's the little warning, the little red herring. I hope you pick that up. Next one, happy and sad. SAD is a wholly owned subsidiary. So this time it's 100%. There were dividends declared of 30,000. And on 16th of January, the amount was paid. So what are the journal entries to eliminate the intragroup dividend? Notice here, recognized on the accrual basis. So recognized before the cash was paid. So debit, dividend income, that's going to push our dividend income down credit dividend retained earnings. So that's going to be exactly the same as here, divid, dividend income, credit dividend retained earnings. But here's the other item that you can't forget. We also have a dividend payable asset, uh, <laughs> liability that has to be reversed with a debit. And we have a dividend receivable asset that's reversed with a credit. So this twist here is saying, not only do you eliminate the income, but you've got to eliminate that asset and that liability that have been created. So there's one component, two components. If you have a little checklist for all of these transactions, you, you won't forget these. Um, you, you can't memorize them, but you just work through the checklist. So any question on intra-group dividend elimination? Simple, awesome, <laughs> yeah. Interestingly though, as, as I went through those questions, if we go back and do a, a few more similar ones, you'll start looking for exactly the same patterns and clicking it in. So Shark bought Dolphin, uh, and then for the 30th of June, that's actually irrelevant for now, but important later, we have an NCI question. Dolphin sold inventory for 20,000, it cost 5,000. So it's made a $15,000 unrealized profit? What are the journal entries? So sold for 20, cost of goods sold five, profit of 15, four and a half thousand dollars worth of income tax. Now that tax in the hands of S exists, that profit. So you're going to pay tax on it, but from the consolidated group, it doesn't yet exist. So there is going to be a deferred tax asset. We also have inventory of $20,000. That is overstated. We need to bring that back down to five. So how do we fix this? Debit sales, credit cost of goods sold. So if we debit that, we've eliminated it. Credit that, we've got rid of the profit. That's step one. We've eliminated 15,000 of profit. Step two. Oh, there it is. 20,000, 5,000. That's why I like the worksheet. Next, inventory has to be reduced in value. It was only worth five, but in the books, it's now 20. So we have to reduce it by 15,000. So it'll look like this. Get rid of that 15,000. And in the consolidated books, it's now back to 5,000. Next, deferred tax asset. Because we've made 15,000 unrealized profit, we will pay tax on it now. But from the group perspective, we won't pay tax on it later when it's realized. So we have a DTA. Any questions on this one now that you've seen those steps? Eliminate completely, still generates an income tax expense. However, we're going to pay the tax now. So from the group perspective, we'll pay less later. We bring our inventory down and it, it literally becomes, all, all CPA can do is give you different numbers and you punch through. So what happens if 30% of the inventory is on hand at the end of the year, that means 70% has been sold. Well, we still have to eliminate the first step. So get rid of the 20, get rid of the five. This is where it gets a bit tricky. So I've used text just to try and explain it step by step. Inventory was originally valued at 5,000. Then it was valued at 20,000. But in answer A, we reduced it all the way back to five. But in answer B, things are changing up. So the inventory balance of the parent 
is going to reduce to $6,000 because 70% has been sold and 30% is left. So 30% of this inventory amount, so it's no longer worth 20,000 in the books, it's going to be worth 6,000. But it's still overstated. 6,000 is still higher than the original 5,000. So what should its true value be? Well, it was previously overvalued by four times. So that's gonna give us that $1,500. So its true value was originally worth 5,000 and there's 30% left. So 30% of the original 5,000 is telling me that the inventory should only be $1,500. How do I bring it from $6,000 to 1500. I am going to need a credit of four and a half thousand dollars. It's going to look like this. I'm going to need a credit of four and a half thousand. That was quite a long explanation, but I hope that makes sense. I need to reduce my overstated inventory of 6,000 to 1500. So you can just let me know yes or no. Did that click for you? So the next thing we've got to adjust for is the cost of goods sold because 70% of this inventory has now been sold. So in the books of Shark, our dolphin sold it to Shark. So in the books of Shark it has a $20,000 asset and it sold 70% of it. So that's going to be turned into cost of goods sold. 70% is going to be 14,000. So the cost of goods sold on this sale is $14,000, but that is too high. The true cost of goods sold is 70% of the 5,000. So the true cost of goods sold is 3,500, but in the books, it'll be 14,000. How do I get from 14 to three and a half thousand? I need to do a credit of 10 and a half thousand. So stage one is simple, eliminate the sale. Stage two is tricky. I need to bring my $6,000 inventory balance down to, um, to one and a half thousand. I need to bring my overstated cost of goods sold because my cost of goods sold is not going to be 70% of 20,000. It needs to be 70% of 5,000. So this credit to cost of goods sold brings it down by that amount. And in this case, I've made some profit. How much profit is unrealized, 30%. 30% of my profit is not yet realized, so I've paid tax on it, but I'm not going to get the benefit of that until the future, that's my DTA. So 30% of the remaining sales, so my total profit was 15,000 unrealized, but 70% of that has now been realized, there's 30% left. So 4,500 unrealized profit, that I've paid tax on gives me a deferred tax asset of 1,350. So I think by, by stepping you through that logic of where those journals, um, so NARDS, it, yes, the DTA reduces, but I don't reduce it from the previous year because every year we do the consolidated worksheet again from scratch. What, what it's saying is in this year's accounts, 70% of the goods have been sold outside the business. So the profit's been realized and 30% is, is yet to be realized. So I've paid my tax too early. Next year when it's all sold, you will have no DTA. <laughs> it takes a while. 70% of the inventory sold in 20X1, the remaining inventory sold in 20X2. We do exactly the same steps for 20X1, so what happens in 20X2? We are going to have to deal with retained earnings. A little bit of a complicated picture, but this will be in retained earnings at the end of the year, our debit to sales. This will be in retained earnings, and this will be in retained earnings. So we get our 20,000, and we adjust our 5,000, we adjust our 10 and a half thousand that we did in the previous period and we adjust for our tax expense because all those items are now in retained profits. So we have, instead of doing 
one, two, three, four journalists, we just do debit to retained earnings. Then this year, credit the cost of goods sold because the remaining 30% is being sold off. Debit to tax expense. <laughs> yeah, it, any exam question you get in the, the same year, nice and easy. In the following year, it's annoying because you've got to do all the retaining profits and adding up. So I, we are already just hit the hour. I might just go through this one. Why not? Uh, I'll yeah I should I'll have a look at that um, in a minute. So here are the steps. In the current year, you do the normal adjustment. In the subsequent years, don't forget to do the retained earnings adjustment. So snakes and ladders. Snakes acquired eighty percent of the shares. It sold a truck with a carrying amount of thirty thousand for fifty thousand. So there's a twenty thousand dollar profit. Eight years, but snake is going to depreciate it over 10 years. That's the red herring. Don't, don't worry about the eight. Only worry about the 10. So $20,000 too much needs to be adjusted for. So get rid of our gain on sale of 20000 That's our first elimination. Next, we've got to bring the truck value down 20000 from 50 to 30. Next, our accumulated depreciation and depreciation expense. We are supposed to do 10% depreciation on $30,000. So that should be $3,000. But we're actually doing it at $50,000. So it's $2,000 too high. So we've got to eliminate that too high amount by $2,000. And the corresponding adjustment is to accumulated depreciation. Next, we are going to pay tax on this $20,000 gain even though it's inside the business. Because we're going to pay tax, we are going to have a deferred tax asset because when we use up that asset, when we use it later on, we will not pay that tax again in the future. But it's not 30% of the 20,000. The 20,000 increased our profits for the group, but don't forget there's extra depreciation now. That extra depreciation of 2,000 will bring it down to $18,000. So we now have 20,000 minus 2,000 gives us a DTA of 5,400. Now that's pretty similar to uh, question two, I think it was. And I hope now that we've looked at a few years, ah, this, this makes a little bit more sense. How I'm stepping through them faster and faster. What minus 2,000? This is the minus 2,000. The original depreciation should have been 3,000, but you've charged 5,000 depreciation. So. If you have more depreciation, your taxable profit will go down, so you'll pay less tax. So your total profit gain was 20, but your extra depreciation was two. So that dealt with it. All right, that was snakes and ladders. The final step is the DTA and the DTA expense. This is in the next year. I might come back to this next year when we talk about um, retained profits and adjustments because, once again, all of these from the previous year have to be bundled together to work out the retained earnings component. This is a balance sheet item, so it doesn't have a retained earnings component. This is that tricky one with accumulated depreciation. It's got last year's plus this year, so 2000 plus 2000 4000 and then this is our depreciation expense. The DTA is going to be based on the original 20,000 profit, but now there's $4,000 worth of depreciation. So now there's only a $16,000 unrealized gain. So that's our adjustment there. And our debit to tax expense, this time our depreciation is $2,000 higher. So that's pushed down our taxable profit. Our taxable profit is down, so we will pay 600 less tax. So it's a debit to our tax expense. I'll leave that just for a moment. And then I'll go through the next couple of questions, which were loans and dividends, I believe. And, so, and this is only about six or seven pages of the study guide, but if, if you get caught here, I mean, it's a quarter of the exam, so it's worth the, the time 
getting consolidations and eliminations right. So three final questions, loan from A to B, management fee for services and loan from P to S. So loan from A to B, entity A loaned 40,000 to B, no interest would be charged if it was repaid, da, 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 was satisfied. What does it look like? There's no journal entries. How good is that question? There would be a debit and credit to the bank within the same group for the same amount, no journals required. The net effect would be zero. Yay. So I hope you like that one. Uh, for the loan and the asset, uh, asset and liability, you can see they've just been reversed. So the loan receivable is an asset eliminated with a credit, loan payable, liability, eliminated with a debit. So management services, $25,000 fee. This one's a bit tricky because 6,000 is still owing. Uh, I'll come back to that, Sandy. So we eliminate the management fee, so debit to the income, credit to the expense, they are now zero. But we also have a fee payable, that's a liability of 6,000 owing, and we have a fee receivable, an asset, and they've just been eliminated. So whenever you get one of these ones, it's not inventory, it's not a sale of a depreciable asset, just do whatever the reverse transaction to make the item zero is, and that should solve the problem. Finally, management fees on this one. What are the tax effects? There are no tax effects because the net effect on profit is zero. There's no cost of goods sold. Whatever was sold, income expense were identical. Loan from P to S. $100,000 loan, 10% interest per annum. Interest not yet paid, so it's going to be accrued and therefore we'll have an accrued uh, liability and an interest receivable. So we've got six months worth of interest. Debit interest income, so debit to the income, credit to the expense, they've now been eliminated. And debit to the loan, credit to the receivable. And they have been eliminated as well. Cool. Well, <laughs> yeah, they're the easy ones. Uh, you still need, Sandeep, you still need to eliminate the entry. You just don't have to adjust for profit. We looked at a couple of um, dividend ones earlier on. Now, I'm about halfway through my slides. Uh, so, because we've still got, um, we dealt with uh, intra-group transactions, but we haven't yet looked at non-controlling interest. What I'm going to do, I'm going to record that non-controlling interest and part C. So I'm going to record how we deal with uh, these factors, NCI, got a nice little flow chart on how to do NCI. It's this final step in the consolidated worksheet. Uh, so the steps, are, I might show you one quick solution. Get the profit, adjust for tax, adjust for unrealized profit and loss. This is where you need to remember everything we just did in tonight's session. Remember to tax it and remember the NCI percentage. If you have this, you can answer the question. So I'm going to show you step by step, big, uh, littered, big and little. And I think this is one of the knowledge checks that we've grabbed the data from. So salt and equipment, here it is. All right, Sandeep, I'll, I will answer that. I'll just go through this one. What is the non-controlling interest in the profit for the year? So here's our formula. So start with the subsidiaries profit. So profit after tax, $20,000. Next, adjust for tax if applicable. We don't need to because it's after tax. But if you were given before tax, multiply it by 30%. Now, adjust for unrealized profit and loss. And that's where we have $1,000, unrealized profit and loss. Then the tax effect from that. So remember tax, $300, unrealized profit will generate $300 worth of tax. From there, multiply by the NCI percentage, which we're given here, big owns 80% of little. And then NCI portion. So there's a a step by step, but we'll go through that in detail in the recording and next week. 
All right, that was a long session and we've still got a lot to get through to finish module five properly. Uh, next week, one of the things I'm gonna do uh, 